Susan Ward is our palliative care chaplain. We are palliative care team, and I think some of you know me. We have worked together. So we are here to tell you a few things that probably you may already know, and if you know, you let me know, and we will go a little faster. We'll keep it open for dialogue rather than a didactic lecture. So, so whatever you need to know. But there are a few things I think you may not know about palliative care. So this is a quote from years and years ago, and true even now, despite so much uh, research and everything in medicine, we are still not able to cure. We just cure sometimes. Surgeons will cure sometimes. Sometimes medical oncology, sometimes cardiac surgeon. But we relieve often. So we definitely leave often. But we, may not, we sh must not forget that we should comfort always. So, and that's where palliative care comes in the last two. So we are here for, for the World Health Organization, as always, they jump into everything and they mess up things because this definition, if you can remember, I can never remember. So, <laughs> but but it's, it's basically relief of suffering. I mean, if you read only this phrase, if you remember, that's fine. Remember, World Health Organization also jumped into pain. In the early 1990s, they said pain control is patient's birthright. Then Jacob put as fifth vital sign, and that caused opioid crisis. They will never admit it, but they were pushing all of us, nurses, doctors, everyone. So, so WHO comes in, but I'm not very fond of them. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what palliative care is, and I think a lot of us, including doctors, nurses, get confused of hospice and palliative care. So for us as physicians, the board exam is same palliative care and hospice. So if you think of hospice as the Cadillac of palliative care, so it's palliative care plus. Palliative care, again, relief of suffering, plus hospice will give a lot many more things, DMEs, and all the medicines will come through them for, for comfort. So many more nursing visits, AIDS visits. So, so hospice is same as palliative care, plus more things. And unfortunately, again, defined by the government, CMS, and Medicare. So and we'll come to that. So, so hospice care, because government does not want any kind of abuse of services, they say that it should be two doctors, including medical director and patients attending doctor should certify or one of the consultant that patient has six months or less. Not hard and fast rule. Patients sometimes survive two years, depending on the diagnosis. They get better. They can be graduated from hospice care. But the palliative care that started in late 80s, early 90s, is the same kind of relief of suffering even when the patients have more than six months. If they may have six years, they may have 10 years, but they can occur any time. It would not prevent the patient from getting, say, chemotherapy for lung cancer or some heart failure treatment or whatever they want. Palliative care can be in conjunction with that. So that's the advantage for the patient and the family. And this will come to with what Medicare A is about. So CMS defined hospice care, which is six months or less, and then patient has to have re irreversible illness, progressive illness, and the hospice has to document that patient is uh, getting worse. Medicare A, and I didn't put A there, but pays only for one of the three, either hospitalization or rehab SNP or hospice. So a lot of times you will read the note, the doctor says the patient is going to sniff with hospice. No, patient cannot go to sniff with hospice, cannot. That would be the same nursing home, patient has to pay privately, long-term care, and Medicare A will take up hospice. Or if they get rehab, they can have palliative care but not hospice. So in terms of payment, palliative care is a service Medicare B pays for, not A. So Medicare B is for doctor's visits, all outpatient stuff, 
and doctors visit even in the hospital. So, so, so we are getting paid through Medicare B. That's why we do not come in the way of any of these things. So palliative care can see the patient while the patient is getting rehab in a nursing home because they're going to get paid by Medicare B and then A will pay for SNP. So these two plus palliative care would be a good combination if you cannot do hospice. So we talked about it's early in the, in the case course of illness, can conjunction with other therapies, and then patients can have tests if they need to. With hospice, hospice has to pick up every single tab. So they don't like patients who have a lot of expensive tests or something. So, so palliative care will, will be fine for those patients whose goals are different than hospice patients. So in old days, it was that you get this life prolonging care, whether it is neurological issue or anything, and suddenly it would stop when the patient would get worse and you get hospice care. Now we think that we can start palliative care earlier so the patients and the family get a lot more help before they become to the, to the, they go to the stage where they have hospice care. So those symptoms would be pain, non-pain symptoms, shortness of breath, constipation, any, anything that they need, and then family support. So, so our other part of the team where it's social issues and spiritual distress, that's where Susan comes into picture for the patient and for the family, both. So, so the goals, again, is symptom control. Rather than think of dying, we tell them to live happily, whatever time they have. I mean, th th there are times where you know that the medicine cannot do anything more. So, so we talk about spending a good life rather than waiting for death. And same thing as hospice, neither hasten nor prolong death. Quality of life gets better because of symptom control. And there are now studies, especially one in lung cancer, that if you involve palliative care, if the symptoms are better, patients have lived longer. So there were chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus palliative care, and the study showed that, that those patients lived longer too. So who knows? So, so we s offer a support system rather than just nurse practitioner or doctor, the whole team to help the patient. Same thing. And so even sometimes the bereavement, uh, which Susan can explain more, that they start to, to feel even before death. And then we integrate everything as patient as a whole. And finally, I think you will see us do a lot of these things. So, so many of our patients come into the hospital, they don't have advanced care planning. They don't have advanced directives. And one of our jobs now is to discuss with them, even if I mean, they may not have any issues, if they have a very serious illness, we think their prognosis is very limited, they may go home with hospice, then we talk about the durable do not resuscitate rather than advanced directives. But if they have more time, it is good to at least designate a, a medical power of attorney or more than one if they want and their wishes towards the end of life. Here, so we are a consultative service. So sometimes you identify the need, but unless the primary doctor calls us, we cannot see the patient. So, so you have to either talk to case manager or tell doctors to, to let us know. And then we will have a team of doctors, nurse practitioners, social workers, chaplain, everyone that will start to work with the patient. And then we do all these things, so, so you know that. So, so we have been checking the outcomes, and in fact, Medicare requires us to check some outcomes. So <laughs> symptom control is one of them, and so if they have pain at 48 hours, whether we have controlled the pain better or not. If we put them on opiates, do we ever think of constipation? Do we give them laxatives? Is another outcome measure that, that CMS wants to check. And then there are others, including the, the psychosocial, spiritual aspect 
of the and National Quality Forum has about 10 or 12 of them. So, so we do all that and it's, we, I think we are one of the consolidated studies where we read your notes more than we read other providers' notes because nursing notes tell us a lot of things. We read CT and OT notes too for functional assessment because that tells us how the patient is going to do once they are discharged from here. So, so functional assessment is part of our, our uh, consults. What is your role? And this is, I think, something important. I think most of you are doing it really well. So, so you already provide them. You are with the patient more than any one of us with most of the time. So, so, so you are already comforting them. They know you're going to bring pain medicine. They know that, that, that they can call you anytime. But so be aware of their needs. So, so this morning before just coming here, we got a call from patient's family in the room that he's agitated, he's in pain. And I wish I had the call from nurse rather than the patient's family. So, so that happens and that's why be aware and you can call us. I mean, we, that you will never find a palliative care provider be upset when you call. So it would be almost unheard of or rare. So you are the advocate for symptom control. If you think that patient is not well controlled, you need help. If the primary doctor, if they don't understand, suggest to them that, that they should call, call us. And again, without hesitation, because uh, that's one of the Innova values of patient always. So, and then we need to, or you need to learn a little bit of basics. So if they are on opiates, we have to ask whether they are constipated or not. When was the last bowel movement? You know that at times they will go home, come back to the ER, just for constipation, just for constipation. So, so you need to know that. Gabapentin, I think, has been used a lot more by surgeons lately, and they don't understand the biological issues with gabapentin that with kidney failure, patients can accumulate more. So we have seen patients postoperatively very, very zonked out and sedated, not from anything else but gabapentin. So be aware, be careful that the pharmacy usually would tell them, but sometimes they miss too. So, so same thing with opiates. If you are, if somebody has a renal failure, morphine is not the right drug because eventually it will accumulate. One or two doses are great, fine. But if they're on chronic con constant medication, you will see second, third day, they will start to get sedated. So, so some basics you should know about these medicines. So, we, what we are, you know. What we are not is, we are not, again, hospice. We are not telling them to stop anything. They can do whatever they want. We can still help them. We are not taking place of curative. We, ca we are adjunct to that. And one other thing which we didn't put here is we are not acute pain service. We have anesthesia. We have post-op acute pain. Rarely they consult us because anesthesia signs off and then we have to manage, but we are more chronic pain. So we are symptom control in advanced illness, ideally. Once in a while, we help uh, <laughs> our colleagues or surgeons or medical doctors to, to control acute pain, but we are not acute pain doctors. We are also not <coughs> chronic addicts doctors, so sickle cell patients or so rarely will see, especially if they have advanced illness, if they have bad lung disease, they have stroke from sickle cell and not going to do well, we would get involved, but not very early in the disease. So this is just some of the, the issues of what patients want and what happens here. And we think that this was an old study, but it may be changing because you will see a lot of patients who like to be in the hospital. You provide such good care to them, they don't want to go home. <laughs> so, so it may be changing. This is our team. So we have four doctors, including Dr. Roche Green, three nurse practitioners, one is leaving, three social workers, and Susan, who will, who will take over this. I'm here, so you can ask me after her.
thing for tumor resection mm -hmm. and you know stroke obviously, but when you say resection, like obviously what time is the start? You kind of start thinking about consulting, you guys are advocating for consulting palliative care. Who should we see them for like a, a night or so? And then they should go home or they sit down for it. You know, at what time, what point is appropriate? So, so you, you can do two things. Yeah. One is yeah, you can either call us, we can see them, or you can let us know and one of our social workers or we'll touch base with them. We hook them up. So if they're going to see Dr. Castro Phillips or someone or radiation therapy mm -hmm. outpatient, mm -hmm. we have Dr. Pinzone who is outpatient oncology palliative care clinic doctor. Mm -hmm. And we can hook him up to follow up with him. Okay. So so he can he can do that. The VCS, the other oncology group has two palliative care doctors. So so depending on what the their patient's need would be, we can do that. Capital Caring, um, Vitas, Heartland, a lot of hospices offer community palliative care. Mm -hmm. So the palliative care specialist either will go to patient's home or nursing home. So we can hook them up depending on what the need would be. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. was too loud anyway. <laughs> Anywhere. Well, good morning. My name is Susan Ward. I know some familiar faces here. I do spiritual support only for the palliative medicine team. There is a chaplain's office and although I am a professionally trained chaplain, um, I tend to only see people who have a palliative care consult. And the reason is that we try to provide spiritual care for all of our patients. And our senses can run from 30 to 50 or more people a day. And so since most of them have serious illnesses, often ones who would call a chaplain anyway, my time is devoted to that. However, if I'm walking down the hall and I see someone falling apart, I do not walk past them. So, and nurses have called me in for crisis of please come in. And even I walk through the ICU and, a, and uh, have been grabbed by Nikki Naziri is like, please come in here right now. And so flexible, you know, I won't say it's not my job, but just so you know what my job is. Um, because of the rules of JCO, palliative care um, must have therapists who are licensed clinical social workers and a board certified chaplain. That means I have a master's degree in theology or divinity as well as going through a chaplaincy training program of 1600 hours, 400 in a classroom and 1200 under supervision in a hospital. So the people who wear green jackets here or green shirts are volunteers in the chaplain's office. They are not trained and so hopefully you get a better level of care from me or the professional chaplains, Dustin and Yanam and Karen, that that's what we're trained for. So just so you know, um, our role on the team is to basically assess people's strengths from a spiritual perspective. We overlap a lot with therapists, but just we're looking at it more from kind of existential issues than psychological issues. Um, we also are looking for what is causing the distress. I think the thing that you probably realize and you probably hear a lot is I hate that I'm out of control, patients or families will say. Being in control relieves stress. Feeling out of control is probably maximum stress, right? And I'm sure as nurses, I see the demands on your time and you probably feel out of control at times. So I'm there for you too. I know I've given some nurses hugs here that um, because you've, you walk into crisis, you walk into people facing death, families losing loved ones, and they're devastated. So, so we're th chaplains are there for you too, just so you know that, okay? Um, and although I have my own faith to do this work, I also have been trained in what m the primary religions believe, what's important to them. So I do have Muslim prayers in my purse, I have Hebrew prayers, I don't speak uh, Hebrew, but English translations. I have an app for Muslim prayers to do the chanting of the Quran. 
Um, I have done meditation with people. I've done healing touch. Energy work is very big among a lot of people who don't profess a faith in a creator. Um, but even those that do like the energy work. I don't know if you're familiar with healing touch, but I've been trained in that as well. So our whole job is to try to relieve suffering along with the physicians. And I want to add that this is palliative medicine and comprehensive care that when Dr. Trevetti walks in, if he identifies tremendous emotional distress or spiritual distress, he does his best to triage, but then will call the therapist or, or me to say, we need some extra help here. If I walk in a room and someone is breathing 30 a minute, grimacing, uncomfortable, this is not the time for prayer. This is a time to get medical attention, okay? So we all are doing comprehensive care as well. And when the therapists walk in and see somebody and say, this distress is not psychological, it is they're wondering where God is in all this, would you please come see? And vice versa, when I deal with somebody and I'm like, these responses are not normal responses. I'll call my therapist and said, I said this, she said that, and talk about the conversation. And the therapist will say, I think we're dealing with a personality disorder. Oh, we're going to go to sleep here. So, um, so we're all doing comprehensive care. So I may walk in, see somebody, and walk out. So if you see that, that's what's going on. Of like, this is not my domain. This is a physician or NP's domain. Okay. Um, so now we're on the the therapist, they are all licensed. Um, so out in the real world, they could be billing to do therapy, um, our three therapists. So they are going in and helping complex situations. I don't know if you've sat in on family meetings where the dynamics can be really tense. And people, for some reason, we assume that people are normal. And then when they come in the <laughs> hospital, they're you know, behaving oddly. And it's like, OK, they bring themselves in, and now you put that dysfunctional family under stress, it can get crazy. Um, you know, physical abuse of families, it's just magnified when they're under stress. So our therapists are amazing. And so they often accompany the physicians and MPs into family meetings because you really need to double team <laughs> some of these uh, situations. Um, so they're also grief counselors. So they do bereavement, um, do follow up sometimes phone calls even after they leave the hospital. Um, they also have some sort of criteria, and I'm not expert in this, but they have some things that they check off an assessment that they do um, in terms of what the issues are so that they do evidence-based practices. Um, and they will also connect to people on the outside where they'll say, she needs a therapist, um, talk to the person, say, can you recommend somebody? And so they'll guide people when they leave how they can help. Um, so anyway, um, what, do you have any questions about what chaplains do? I know there's a lot of misconceptions that you call a chaplain and I come in and pray and they die, but um, <laughs> it does happen from time, right? But um, we can do so much more, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I get to uh, walk in and they're going, oh, we don't need you yet. She's still here. I'm like, so, so some people do do that, but, um, but anyway, so we're so privileged to be part of this hospital. I think it was about five, five and a half years ago, uh, we became an in-house service. So all the physicians and therapists in me are employees of Inova Fairfax Hospital. Um, at the other Inova hospitals, they have palliative care under contract doctors. Um, and I know they're trying to expand it. Um, but. It's a slow process. Um, so anyway, so questions? Yes. So if we have a patient who has a palliative or is complex stress or falling and they really feel like a stranger in the world and the patient is just too, it would be one of the questions of how severe is it or what is the age mm -hmm. or what is the extent of that pain? Like well, we all have our own spectral links. We're all on tiger text. Um, However, the 4289 that's palliative care, there is a person that has like a, a desk job to answer the phone. And so then she will tiger text me or the therapist uh, who is assigned to that family or patient. Um, so, and I occasionally, <clears throat> probably shouldn't say this, there are some physicians that know what I do and like what I do. And so I do get called and they said, we don't need the doctors, we've got this controlled. 
but there's tremendous existential distress, I think you're the right person for this. And so I have done that with the medical director's permission, not too often, but there's just cases where with letting go, I seem to be able to help people let go and uh, to withdraw of the artificial life support, which I do do in, with palliative care, but sometimes they're at that point and they just can't let go and they're like, we don't need to introduce another doctor into this picture, but we need help saying, you're telling me you believe in God and heaven and, and this person is suffering. And they're like, but I can't live without my husband, my wife, my daughter, whoever. And so it's a very gentle dance um, to help someone let go. And so I've just been doing it for six years and so occasionally I will do that too. Um, so not out of the question, but um, I don't build, they all do, so, <laughs> yeah. You can contact anyone. If you have the notes from Dr. Paul, you know right. number by heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my spectral link is on my notes, so if, if I've already seen, to call back. What is your sense on that, Dr. Freddy? Yeah, so there was this screening tool that was developed mm -hmm. by Dr. Hines, and case managers used to do that. I think they still do it, and we have a lot of data of how many patients screened positive for palliative care and not transferred. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we, it's double-edged sword. So if we do get transferred on everyone that was screened positive, I don't think we have enough providers. So, but, but that's why I think it's very important for you and the doctors to, to make sure that they, if they cannot provide, so there is something called primary palliative care, which some doctors are very good at that. I mean, some oncologists may know things pretty well to, because they need this end of life, you see. So they may not need us, which is okay, which is okay. But yeah, if you identify, then definitely you should let us know. But yeah, there is, I, I mean, I don't have the data right now, but we have a lot of data on how many consults were generated. They were not screened positive, and how many were not consulted on positive screen. And uh, that's a really big discrepancy, so you're, you're absolutely right. Any other questions? Anyone else? Thank you for all that you do. It's a real privilege to serve with you all. I, Before I was in chaplaincy working out in the world, I had no idea how incredible um, nurses are in really providing incredible care beyond the love that you do, but just the medical knowledge that you have and the attention to detail and the catches that you make. I'm just so impressed. So I thank you all for doing what you do and I'm privileged to work with you all. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.